Jeremiah 29, 11, yeah. that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm on the highway now trying to hit the, the divide of the partition on the Belt Parkway. And this scripture jumps into my mind. I'm hearing the voice of God. He says, because I know the thoughts that I have towards you. I'm, I've been thinking about you. He said, I've been thinking about you since before the foundation of the world, and I need you here. You can't die now. Yes. So know what he says. He said, when you were born, my dreams came true. I want that to hit your soul. When you were born, the things that God were imagining before the foundation of the world came to pass on the day of your birth. Amen. That's how important you are to God. Amen. Your God's dream come true. Amen. Let that sink in for a minute. While I was in this process, I said, Lord, how do I know that I am your dream come true? And very simply, he said, because you're still alive. Amen. Just like that. He said, I would have snatched you out of here if I no longer had need for you. That's all I needed to hear. If you fast forward a few years later, here we are, and I'm reading this scripture, and this scripture takes a whole other perspective to me. And it says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Who is him? Speaking about the Lord. Now, look at what it says. I want you to read this with me for, from the word four. One, two, three. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Let's say it one more time. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Father, speak to me and I'll speak to your people in Jesus' name. He that comes to God must believe that he is. Some of us think we believe that God is real. But we don't. We don't believe. Because the weight of believing God would never allow you, hear what I'm about to tell you, to doubt that whatever he puts in your spirit can be done. Because if you know the gravity of the existence of God, Shanique, you would say, God if you gave me this idea, it can be done. I don't know how you're going to do it. We didn't work out the details yet. But if you gave it to me, it should be done. I don't care how big the dream is. It can be done. If it's a bridge, then God told you to build it. Book. Noah got a plan from God to build a vehicle to accommodate something that did not exist on the planet. When God told Noah to build the ark, rain had not fallen for, for quite some time. So what had happened was there was a whole generation that did not know what rain was. They did not have a clue what rain was. So God says, build me a boat. For what? Because rain is coming. The preacher man now has to go outside, find wood. Imagine going to Home Depot. For waterproof wood because rain is coming and the people at the, at the store don't know what rain is. <laughs> how, do I, how, do I, how do I provide something for something that does not exist? I'm going to tell you. By faith. How can you provide a church for people who are lost and you don't know how to run church? By faith. How can you be a mother? Hallelujah. Yes. And you've never been a mother or you know you're pregnant. Yes. You, you ever thought about that, Sister Peggy? You got nine months to figure it out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't get a certificate that fast. Right. I got nine months to figure out how to raise a child. But God knows if I put it in you, yes. I have already provided you with what's required yes. to get the job done. Is this making sense? This is, this, is, this is the setup now. He says, well, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. So we ended our conversation last week with the concept of the isness of God. It's a word. Okay? The isness is. I, is I S. I'm going to say I-Z. I-S-N-E-S-S. -S -S. The isness of God. So I begin to look at the text again, sis, and I said to myself, 
For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Here's the thing that blew my mind when it comes down to the presence of God. When you're thinking about the presence of God, you've got to know what, you have to believe what God is, not what you think he ought to be. There is a difference between isness, if I could, and oughtness. Does that make sense? Oughtness, O-U-G-H-T. Oughtness, I feel like, I feel like Miss Seeley in the color purple. <laughs> right? Oughtness, right? There, there is something that is. We, we, when we get married, hallelujah, if you, want a, if you want a book to help you prepare, if you're single and you're looking and you're courting, you should see Sister Shanique for her book, Becoming the One, all right? If, if you're looking, you, you want to know what, what you're going to, you want to know what, what you're going to be. You're looking for the person, you think about what they're going to be, you think about you want them to be tall, short, you want them to be skinny, you want them to be fat, you want them to be light skinned you want them to be dark skinned you want bald headed, you want dreads, whatever it is. You make up in your mind what he ought to be or she ought to be. Am I correct? Yes. Then you go dating Am I, and then you start collecting data and you find the person and then all of a sudden God shows you something different. Amen. I wish one of the married folk would back me up on this. Amen. Amen. And then, <laughs> watch me kidding. <laughs> My wife told me I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to preach much as a pastor. And what she got was different than what she thought. I'm is different than what I ought to be from my wife's perspective. Does that make sense? Yes. So she thought that she was going to get somebody who lay maybe a musician, definitely a Christian, but never a preacher, and absolutely not a pastor. But what is, what, is different than what ought to be. I'm going to explain this. Because when you know who God is, you will never mistake him for what you imagined him to be. When you know who God is, you can't tell him what he ought to be because what he ought to be is not who he is. Let me help you. Some of you say that God is love, and he is. But because we have a, we have a misconception of what the definition of love is, we try to tell God how he ought to love. How he ought to love. So we turn around and be like, God, you ought to do, you should, you're supposed to take care of this person. Says who? Based on scripture, God is also a judge. Hallelujah. Don't get mad at me. It's in the book. So there are certain things that God is, is going to do and he is not going to do. And our opinion cannot change that fact. And the, the, the quicker you come to the realization that God is going to be God, he has been God from the beginning, and he is not going to stop being God the way he wants to be God, and because of our opinion, is the faster you come into deliverance. Oh, yeah. Mm. You know how many times you pastor, why is it that God allows good, bad things to happen to good people? I ask him a few questions. Number one, what makes them good? Yes. What makes them good? Yes. Jesus himself, they say, good master. Jesus himself says, no one is good. Yes. Save the Father in heaven. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because they give food to the poor. The young rich ruler came to Jesus and he said, I did all of this. And he said, well, sell it. Yeah. <laughs> because he thought he was good. <laughs> There's some things that we think is good because media tells us it's good. Because the world says they're nice people, so we say they're nice people, and God should be nice to them. Hello, somebody. But truth and in fact, there's some things that God is not, and there are things that God is. And it's necessary to recognize this. If you want to come consistently into the presence of God, I have to come in wanting God who is, not the God who I want him to be. Your worship will be better. If you know that God is. Because we've created in our mind this idea of God. Even Moses couldn't handle God. The Bible says that Moses asked to see God face to face. And God said, you can't handle me. That's not a nice God, is it? 
God, nice gods don't talk like that. I don't have time. I don't have time to talk to you right now. That's how God spoke. How do how do I know what God is? It's pity, but it's in here. If you want to know who God is, get in His Word. Amen. You can talk to me all you want, but talking to me is not like talking to God. You come to Bible study all you want. That's why I want you to come to Bible study. Not so you can hear my opinion, but you can you can learn who God is. Amen. So then when you're not in Bible study, you won't be you won't be telling people what you think God ought to do. Amen. Some of our prayers are based on what we think God ought to do. Amen. Some of us are prophets because somebody thought you ought to be a you've been in that church for how long and you're not a minister yet? You ought to be preaching by now. Well, you ought to mind your business. I want you to get this, okay? And I want to set this, I'm taking my time for this foundation on purpose. Because when you know who God is, no one can make you become what you want to become or what they want you to become. When you know who God is, you're going to go with God all the way. I may be going at two miles per hour. You may be going 122 miles an hour. We're going to get to the same place where God is because we know him. So because you make more money than me doesn't mean that you got more God than I do. Well, wait a minute. Yes. Because I have more money than you don't mean I know God any less either. Yes. Rich is not a sin. Right. Right. Neither is poor. Right. Skin color is not a sin. Right. So we've got to recognize that God is what the way God functions, it's for all people who desire to know Him. If you don't desire to know God, then you are all you are already outside of the will. But he that cometh to God, which means that there is a place where I can find God, Shani, and that's in his presence. Amen. We did an exercise last week, last last time I was before you, and I want to do it again really fast. I want you to look around the room and find five people wearing black. Five, five people wearing black. When you got it, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Y'all found black, 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 black. Thank you. You can put your hand down. Did you see that many people wearing black before? I asked the question. You saw it. Okay, good. What's your favorite color? Pink. And we looked for pink last week. You should have been. <laughs> Most people wouldn't recognize the thing because they weren't paying attention to it, okay? One of the most dangerous things about, about, the, about your faith walk is you walk, with, you walk by faith, the Bible said, not by sight. The problem is, Sister Carmen, we're not looking for God in our faith walk. So therefore, we don't recognize his presence, okay? Sometimes, if, for me, as for example, because I worked in buildings, I always notice the exit signs. I always look for doors. I always count windows. That's just me, okay? Because I, I was taught, based, based on what I did, that just in case of emergency, you need to know where the exit signs are. And because of my, uh, because of my psychological makeup, I know if there's an emergency, I'm going to be one of the people to help folks out the door. So it's innate in me to look for doors and windows and exit signs. This for some women, it's innate to look for girlfriends who have similar hairstyles. It's just what girlfriends do. You make, you create, you find what you look for. Many of us can't find God because we don't look for him even when we come to church. That's true. Yes. Can you say amen? That's true. Yes. Say ouch. So I come to church, I sing the songs, I fellowship with the people, but I don't look for the God in the so the God of the song. I don't look for the God of the church. I don't look for the God of the people. And I wonder why I am empty when I leave God's house. Because I walked into a room not looking for something. Why would I? Now, I understand window shopping. I get window shopping. 
I'm all for it, Carla. I get it. I window shop when I when I'm in between blessings. Amen. <laughs> I window shop when I'm in between blessings. But the truth is, Berto, I don't go to the mall to window shop when I'm broke. I don't. Because I'm tempted. I know what I'm looking for. Hallelujah. And if I get there, I'm going to figure out a way. I say, oh, I need this. Which is one of the most frustrating things is to go shopping and not have money to get what you, what you want. Amen. I'm not going to go look for something that I can't have. Whoa. Can I help some of us in our worship experiences? Mm -hmm. Because we don't believe that we can have God, we come to worship, we sing the songs, we dance. No, that's not worship. That's not what worship looks like. Only. But because we don't come with the willingness to give what it takes to get it, we walk away frustrated. And we say, I didn't, I didn't meet God in there. And then we start to church hop. Um, I can't find God. You can find God anywhere you want. You can find him in the pit. You can find him in the palace. You can find him, you can find him, you can find him in the strip club. Oh, that, oh Pastor, fix it. <laughs> I'm not telling you to go to the strip club. <laughs> I'm telling you that, that God can visit people there. Wherever people are, God is. Can I help y'all real fast? Jesus did not leave a building. He did not leave money as an inheritance for the church. He left people, 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 people. Big people, small people, mad people, crazy people, happy people, sad people. They are the currency of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not built by churches. It's built by people. And any time you have to feel broken in the presence of God and not be built up, you're in the wrong place. Yeah. Yeah. In the wrong place. I understand being cut. But sir, ma'am, stitch me up or you put me out the operating room. Help me, at least. Don't buke me and scorn me and don't fix me. Because at the end of the day, it's people. The currency of the kingdom is people. And what the church was designed to do was to get people who are far from God to come to him. The purpose of the church was to evangelize the world not to get them to come to church but to get them to come to him Amen. and when they come to him they help to build the church it's a system but before they come to him they have to believe that he is oh I got a church now now, now I can teach now I can teach now I can teach People have to become aware of exits. You have to build an awareness of exits. Build an awareness, and this is not this is not supernatural. This is this is this is fatherly advice, right? You you're you're a fire safety director, right, sir? Yes. What well, your job is to make sure that fire extinguishers are in place, doors working, that kind of stuff, right? Yes, sir. I'm gonna give you some advice, y'all. Anywhere you go from here on out, I don't care how pretty the movie theater is. Look for the exit signs. Amen. Look for the, look for the exits. I know you're in the place, but look for the way to get out. There's only one place in scripture that was ever designed that did not have an exit. Not hell. That's a good answer. Only place ever designed in scripture on, in, on the planet is Eden. There was a way to get in. No, there was no way out. No natural exit. This is important. I want to go here for a minute because when it comes down to presence, if you, if you want to go in, you got to know how to get out. All right? But there's some places when you go in, you should not want to get out. And the presence of the Lord is one of them. If you ever sit down and get a chance to do a full, I'm not going to do a full exposition on the guard on the Eden of, 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 of Eden. 
or the garden within Eden. But you must recognize that there is a place where you can be with God. God can be with you and you don't have to leave God. In the natural, in scripture, it was the garden of Eden. However, however, there comes a point in our life that was because of the, the fall of man, we were put out of that place. They didn't know how they got in, but they were definitely they were definitely shown the way out. Let me demonstrate that in a minute. But the garden, John, was the place where there was no exit sign. God did, never intended for them to leave. Watch this. But they were going to continually have him present with them. This is important to recognize. Do you know that there is a place in God where you don't have to miss God ever? There comes a, I'm saying this again, that you, where you don't miss God, where you don't miss the warning of God, where you don't miss the wooing of God, where you don't miss the, the beckoning of God, where you don't hear, where you don't miss the word. There's a place in God, hear me, where you can be with God, God can be with you, and the design, the principle, the picture, the paradigm was the Garden of Eden. There was no exits because God never intended for them to leave. Now, Someone said, Pastor, the Garden of Eden is a, was, a, was, a, was a mythical place. No, they have proof of it. Do your research. Again, my, I'm not going to do an exposition on the Garden of Eden today. But I want us to understand in principle, there was a place where God put his people where they can be there, have jobs, exist, make babies, and God would be present. Yes. I want you to begin to receive that in your spirit, man. That it's possible that I can actually be with God and God can be with me and I don't lose access to him. We learned this, that before the fall, we had an audience with God. After the fall, we had to settle for access to God. Okay, Before the fall, we had an audience with God. After the fall, we had to settle for access to God. Okay? Before the fall, our audience was called fellowship. After the fall, that access was called worship. Follow me? Amen. So before the fall, we didn't have to move. We didn't have to ascend. We had to do nothing. God was there. We had, we had a scheduled meeting with God daily. And we would just, he would just discuss his day with God, and God would discuss his day with him. And he, hey, God, I planted a tree today, and God was like, I built a universe today. Right? This is that kind of conversation. After the fall, what happened was man could not comprehend, Carla, what it was to stay in God's presence. It was too much for him. So God said, I'm allowing you to have access to me. Access. Access. When you come to the, when you want to get grow in the presence of God, begin to think access on your job access, amen. At home access on a date with your husband or your wife access. I didn't say with your boyfriend and girlfriend, not because I'm against it, but because husbands and boy, uh, husbands and wives should date too, amen. amen. Take your take your spouse on a date. Amen. That should have ended with courtship. Matter of fact, now you're married. Y'all should be able to do that more. Yes. Even with the babies, put that on the hip, right here. <laughs> Hold on. Put it on the hip. Just take it with you. Watch this. Access. Everybody say access. Access. Access is the elementary level to having audience with God. Okay? Remember I said audience, fellowship, access, worship. So I'm going to change the formula. Worship is the fundamental level to having fellowship with God. If you want to have fellowship with God, you must learn to worship him. Amen. Amen. Hey, y'all follow me? Right. Yeah. Amen. I know, I know y'all sound like they're speaking in tongues. They're saying amen. Amen means I agree. That's all that means. Amen. They may say yes or it is so. Amen. When you spend time with God's presence, Things start to shift in your life. And it becomes frustrating to those who don't want the presence of God. Amen? Yes. 
You ever had a time with God where you committed your way to fasting and praying? There comes a point where certain conversations don't satisfy you. You begin to think, not you're not thinking down. It's just my spirit can't handle. My, my, I just can't, I can't. You ever ate something that your body just couldn't take? Yeah? When you spend enough time with God, and I believe that everyone should make it our business to spend time with God. When you spend enough time with God, God begins to now say, I want you to spend time with me. I'll talk to you. I'll visit you. I'll, 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 I'll commune with you. And I'll, I'll embrace you. When you do that, certain things happen. You don't speak the same way. You don't talk the same way. Not because you're better, but because you've been. Can I say that? I'm not better. I just been. I've been somewhere. Remember the first time you went away on vacation and your friends didn't go on vacation? You get on a plane, you go somewhere, and then your friend's like, where you went? What you did this summer? I went to, I went to Virginia. What you do this summer? I went to St. Vincent. Where's that? Well, you gotta, you gotta get on a plane and get on a smaller plane and fly between the mountains somewhere and land on a rock. Watch this. But people become so engulfed with it, if when you begin to pull back, you're supposed to act differently when you've been somewhere. Can I, I, I want to, can I stay there for a minute? You're supposed to act differently when you've been somewhere. I'm going to say it one more time so it hits your spirit. You're supposed to act differently when you've been somewhere. You begin to learn, you begin to learn the characteristics, the traits, the behaviors of the other place, the other culture. So I can't, I can't behave the way I did as though I had never been. It's different to hear the story about going somewhere than to have been somewhere. You hear me? I heard about Jamaica. I heard it's hot. But it isn't until you get down into Ocho Rios and you've eaten some real authentic jerk chicken. Right? Then you begin to say, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't eat Brooklyn jerk anymore. How do, I can't eat Brooklyn jerk chicken anymore. I've been somewhere. I'm not better. I've been. I've been. It's nothing, it's nothing, it's nothing. Weird. I'm not trying to be fresh. I'm not trying to be better. I've just been somewhere. I've been there, right? And you, you're different. When you, when you, when you stood in the presence of greatness, you don't just, you don't, you learn to act different. You walk different. You talk different. You, come, you don't stand a certain way. You, you, you lead differently. You speak differently. You've been somewhere. You learn. I went, listen, some of y'all laughing at me because I'm curtsying all the time to some of y'all. But I've been somewhere. I understand that in the presence of women that deserve this kind of treatment, you curtsy. It's not because I'm trying to be better. I'm just, I've just been. And I'm trying to teach y'all something. But watch this. When men fell, they stopped having access to places where God was. So come, Terry. Come, Elijah. Real fast. Real fast. I want y'all to grab this door and stand it up right here in the middle of the, middle of the stage. Just stand it up in the middle. Turn it this way so they can see me on the other side. All right. So you the hinge. I want you to stand on here. Yeah, you here. Can you hold this up by yourself? Mm -hmm. Okay, stand in the back and hold it up by yourself. Step to the side for me, turn, please. Now I want y'all to see something here. <laughs> you want know, to see it too. Let me sit down. <laughs> I want y'all to see something here. When men fell, when men fell, Something came in the way. In actuality, where is it? Come, you brother Kenny, come. Terry, get that one. Get, 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 get it, get it. Yes, yes, sir. All right. So the Bible says Genesis chapter four, Genesis chapter three. I want you to yeah. I want you to see this Genesis chapter three. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Uh, verse 23. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth out of the garden, or from the garden, to, the, to till the ground where he was taken. So 
he drove out, he drove the man out and placed at the east two. He put angels. Come on, pull them out. Yeah, pull them. Yeah, pull it out. Yes, sir. All right. <laughs> the other one, the other one, that's the baby. There's another one in there. Right. Yeah, the big dog. Yes, sir. Oh. So they're angels now. This sheriff is the saints are like, Lord, pass the guy. I got weapons. Listen, you should have been here for them when I talked, I talked about the guns. All right. All right, so stand here. Stand here. Y'all both, y'all are acting as soldiers. Amen. Amen. Stand right here. All right. In front of the door. I'm Adam. Just in case, just in case I wanted to go where I had been. These brothers were here, right? Yeah, that's it. You do. Uh -huh. yep. That was the intent. This was the design. Watch this. God said, because you fell, I am going to remove your access from you with a sword. I'm gonna, I want you to hear what I'm about to tell you. With a sword. So now, I, the Bible says, as a matter of fact, with the other they went. So you go on the other side of the door too. So just in case... I made it around Brother Kenny. There was another man, another angel, on the other side with a sword drawn. Right. Bible said flaming. So even if I figured a way to get around this angel, there was another angel who said, you can't even come back here. God is doing, but God didn't do this for punishment. God did this for prevention. Because what man had come to, because they had been in his presence, if they would have taken the information that they had while they had been with him and gone back in, after they, had, after they, they ate from the knowledge of the tree, the, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the only other tree that would have satisfied them would have been the tree of life. Yes. Now that I know the difference between good and evil, the only thing that would satisfy me is eternal life. The problem was God understood that man, though he could not ascend to be where God was, he said, I would never allow man to suffer by, by being alive eternally, knowing good and evil. Because they didn't have the, the, they didn't have the God gene to know how to, how to handle sin and not be corrupted. Amen. So what God did was, I'm going to stop you from getting in there. Y'all follow me? Yeah. So watch this. Man's separation... Man's separation began, John, with a sword. I got five minutes and 38 seconds to fix this. They, man's separation from God's presence began with a sword. I'm going to say it again. Man's separation from God's presence began with a sword. All right. Sooner or later, God said, I can allow them to even find the sword. I don't want my church to be down here. So thank you, brothers. I can go back over to the side. Go on the side. The source, the door stays. So what happened was God now says, if they want to access me, I don't want them to be afraid because of the sword, but they have to be able to get through the door. So the door remained, the sword left. So in order now for man to have access to God, he gave them the pattern of the, of, of, of the tabernacle. And he says, in order for you to get to you, in order for you to get to God, you've got to do certain things. The laws were regulations. They were the password to get to God. The laws were the password to get to God. So if I'm not, and I say, hey, it's me, he would have said, what's the password? I would have had to recite the law. That's how I, that's how I become bar mitzvah. I have to know the law. But not only do I have to know the law, I have to have kept the law. And because God knew, because God knew we couldn't keep the law, what he said was, I'm just going to give you a man who can go behind the, behind the door and he'll work on your behalf. The problem with that is when you have a middleman who does not know you, he can only speak on his, from his perspective on his behalf. Amen. Amen. So the doorkeeper could only speak on behalf of them that they knew. This is why, hear me, this is why they had to have several feasts a year because the families kept growing. You have to bring different types of sacrifices because I, I don't know you. But I know what a turtle dove looks like. The anatomy for the turtle dove doesn't change. But sin in man is ever changing. Yeah. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. So God said, yeah, no, no. This is cool. So something, uh, something else spectacular happens. Watch this. Now man sees the door. 
Okay, man sees the door. Man sees the door, and God says, you know what? I'm going to show you something with the door. I'm going to establish worship. And worship is going to be now your password to get past the door. It's not just word. It's not just law, but worship. So God did something spectacular. When Right before he, left, he put Adam and Eve out of the garden, the man and the woman out of the garden, what he did was he sacrificed something and covered them. So before they got through the door, he gave them a door. Say it again. Before they got through the door, God gave them a door. It was called the skin of a beast. He killed, created sacrifice. So watch what happens, JR. I want y'all to get this. Worship is a door to accessing God. This is why Paul says we have to include sacrifice as our reasonable act of worship. Romans chapter 12. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice because worship becomes the door. You can tear the door down if you know how to worship. Mm. If you know how to worship. As I, as I go in and worship, this begins to come down. Now, 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 now. Got two more minutes left. God now says, I need y'all, if you want to be in my presence, sacrifice something. So, of course, we learned how to bring animals and beasts and all of that. That was how we gained access. But God says, the problem with that is I'm a living God. You are a living man or woman. A dead sacrifice doesn't qualify you to come behind the door anymore. The blood had to be hot of the dead thing. But God said, that ain't going to work. So what he did was he implemented a new technique called praise. Mm. Praise now was the thing where we went, what is praise? Simply put, praise is acknowledging God for what he's done, what he's doing, and what he will do. Or eulogizing him. The same way we talk about people when they're dead, that's what praise is. Do you understand why he wants a living sacrifice? Yeah. Why would you bring God something that you would give to a dead man? Mm-hmm. Praise in the Greek is your legio, where you get eulogy. Yes. Why would you give God what you would give a dead man? So we've got to go deeper than that. Amen. So Moses, watch this. Moses shows up, and Moses said, this ain't going to work. God gave him the pattern. They put a door in the, middle, in, the, in the back end of the tabernacle, and when they were getting ready to cross over, whenever God would go, God's glory would come, God's glory would sit behind the door. That's still a problem, because only the person who makes it behind the door can receive that glory. And then I have to come back out and share with other people what I heard God say. If you're like me, you have a problem with that. How do I know you're telling me the truth? So something transpires, y'all. When Jesus comes on the scene, Jesus becomes the living sacrifice, the example of the living sacrifice. Wait. But in one of his discourses, Jesus says, I am the door. Hear me. I am the door. So the thing that used to keep you blocked, if you get me, you get to him. This is why you, we got to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because people think that they can just show up to God. The truth of the matter is, Jesus, if you don't have him the right way, he will stop you from getting in. If you don't have Jesus the right way, he says, I am the door. If you don't have me right, you can't get in. So Jesus now says, I'm the door. He said, no, matter of fact, and the translation for that in the language was, it means that he lays down at the gate. Yes. So no sheep can come into the fold without Jesus. Literally, they have to jump over him. So you coming from this way, he lays like this. If you ain't in here, he pushes you away. So Jesus says, while that's good, that's still too much work. I need to shed my blood for sure that is going to shift this. Now, here's where I close and I want y'all to get this. The blood of Jesus now gives me access to the presence. 
the only thing that will keep you, even if you call on the blood of Jesus, the only thing rather that will keep you from him is if you don't. How do how do that how does that work? Jesus says that there is one way to get to me. You must confess with your mouth. Am I correct? Yes. And believe in your heart. Yes. Watch this, Jr. Ephesians chapter six tells us in the armor, the arsenal, yes. the armory, that the word of God. is the sword. Watch this. The word, John chapter 1, hallelujah. Verse 1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word say it, the word was God. The word was God. So watch this. The one who became the door also is the sword. If you want to get access to the presence of God, you first must believe that he is. When you make the confession with the word, Jesus now breaks down the partition that separated you from God. So Jesus says, if you want to get to God, you got to come through me. But the only way to get through me is to use me. Yes. Yes. The only way to get to him is through me. I, this is why the, the, the this is why the, the veil of the t of the tabernacle the temple had to be rent not from the bottom to the top but from the top to the bottom because it was the stroke of God the final stroke of God was the sword named Jesus Christ the final stroke of God was when Jesus died he was the, the apostle will say the finished move of God the final one open it up. Now watch this. Watch this. Many of us can't access God's presence in real life because we try to knock on doors, John. We don't use a sword on the door. Watch this. The sword, hear me, is the word of God. So we try mechanical means to get through in situations in our life when all we need is the word. Amen. Come on, neighbor. All Amen. I need is the word. Amen. All, literally, all you need is the word. Amen. Final thought. Could it be that many of the walls in our life are really doors that we did not speak to? Could it be that what we're calling walls, I hit this wall, the devil is up against me, I can't go, he's see. Could it be that many of our walls are really doors in disguise? Open your mouth when you get a chance, glorify your God because he is ripping the, the, tent, the veil from the top to the bottom of your behalf. You're getting access to things that nobody else in your world can get access to. Yeah. He's opening doors. He's allowing you to, to tap into resources that no one else had, get, had resource to. God is dealing with some of us. He is showing you that you, you've got access. You just got to act like you've been. See, stop acting like you better and act like you've been. If you've been behind the veil, act like you've been behind the veil. If you've been in the presence of Jesus, act like you've been in the presence of Jesus. If you've been healed, like it. You're not better. You just been. That's the wonder of his presence. Moses. I'm going to close with this. Come get this thing, sir. Moses. When he went up into the mountain, chapter 34 of the book of Exodus, the Bible says that Moses was in the presence of God, and the presence of God shone so brightly on him. When he came down, the people covered them. So what they did was, what I used to say, J.R., that the people covered Moses. No. Moses covered his own self. He covered his own face for the sake of not intimidating the people. Wait a minute. He covered his own face and said, I'm, when I come down to you, I'll cover my face. When I go back to God, I'll take the veil off. Watch this. Many of us have missed God and an opportunity to minister because we veiled 
the fact that we've been somewhere. We, we veil it. We hide it. We, we put it away. The fact that I've been somewhere. We put doors up when people should be seeing the glory of God on our lives. The only one who has a right to put the door up is God himself. The only one who has a right to put, to put a partition between anyone that God sends your way is him. So if and in fact you really want to be in the presence of God, what you would do is you'll stop hiding the fact that you've been with him. Take the veil off. Yes. Take the veil or stop hiding the fact that you've been there. Stop feeling bad that you have a prayer life. Stop feeling sorry that you fast. Stop feeling bad that you read your Bible. Read your Bible. Don't be ashamed of it. Let them know that you love the Lord and love oh, the Lord. Yes. Because the truth of the matter is, the only one that can stop the glory from being revealed in your life is you. Yes. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> the only one who can stop the glory of God, the very manifest presence of God is you. So we're gonna, we, we have to learn to pull the veil off of our own faces. Learn to take the veil off of your experience. Take the veil off of your hurt. Take the veil off your victories. There are too many veiled victories in this room. Too many veiled victories. Y'all are hiding your testimony. A whole generation is missing God because you won't tell them that you struggled in your life. A whole generation doesn't believe in God because we would not tell them that God brought me. There's a whole generation that doesn't believe in God because rather than encouraging them, we gossip with them. There's a whole generation that doesn't believe in God that be because they become uncomfortable with the fact that we've met God. Take the veil off of your victory. That was a victory of Moses to stand in the presence of God. It was a victory, but he hid it. And I want to challenge you men and women of God. Stop hiding the fact that God is with you. Stop hiding the fact that you won. Stop hiding the fact that you are lifted by God. Yeah. Oh my God. Woo, that one hit me. Stop hiding the fact that you won. Don't be ashamed of it. I was there. I was abused, but I got out. Yeah. I've overcome. Stop hiding the fact that you were hungry and somebody met you with something when you didn't have it and they blessed you. Don't hide that because now you're in the position of a blesser. Yeah. Stop hiding your victory. Ooh. Father, unveil our victories. Unveil our victories. Let us no longer be ashamed of what we've been through. Let us no longer be ashamed of what hurt us. Let us no longer be ashamed of where you've taken us. Let us no longer be ashamed of the fact that Jesus' blood was the way I got out. Make me aware, Lord, that not only and not only have I have I won, but Father, I my witness is going to be a prophecy to someone else. Yes. And Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would allow us, oh God, to unveil our victory. Yes. Father, for our desire is not to be better than, but simply to say that we've been with you. In the name of Jesus. Father, I pray that every word in our mouth be a mighty sword that would rip membranes in the name of Jesus, that would set men and women free in Jesus' name. Father, I decree and declare that our testimonies in this season, while people are trying to commit suicide, our Facebook testimonies, our Snapchat stories, Father God, our personal phone calls are going to cause men and women to give up, put down the, put down the drugs, put down the alcohol, to leave the new salon, to put the gun down in the name of Jesus. Father, I decree and declare that those of us in this room who have decided to take the veil of our victory to allow us to show where we've been, Father God will be the ones that will stand in between. And Father, we then now, not because we want to be, we become the door of access. We become the access point to victory. We become the access point to victory. We are the access point to victory in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I prophesy in Jesus' name that those of you who went through hurt in your 2017, if you would be willing to pull the veil off of it at the end of the year, your 2018 will be a different year. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I decree and declare that as you open up your mouth to give God praise, right now, right now, right now, as you open up your mouth to give God praise, He is going to shake your year. I will prophesy your year will be shifted from your way to unveil yourself. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, reveal us, Father. Reveal us, God, so they can have revelation. Reveal us, God, so they can see you differently. Reveal us, God. Reveal us, God. Reveal us, God. We unveil ourselves. We unmask our battles. We unmask our battles. 
Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Unmask your matters. I just heard the Spirit of the Lord say, there's some resource laying up for somebody. When you tell people how dire your strength is. I just heard the Lord say, somebody has been hiding their lack because they're afraid of what people are going to say. God says that somebody has your resources waiting for you. If you would unmask your matter, I don't know who this is, but I just, I just went through somebody's pantry. You're less than a couple days worth of food left. God said, unmask it. It's here. It's here. It's here. It's here. The permission is here. Unmask your matter. 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 Unmask it. Unmask it. For the hour, for your provision is at hand. Father, we commit our way to unveiling. Hallelujah. Our victory in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. There is a there is someone who's a mother. Not you. Somebody who's a mother in this room who's having issues with their dad, their children's father. Father said to me just now, don't be afraid of his family because your victory is in the mouth of the woman who should have been your mother-in-law. Your victory is in the mouth of the woman who should have been your mother-in-law. That's two issues right there. Two matters that the Lord just brought forth. Baby daddy issue and a food issue. It's a food issue. Brother says somebody is at lack and they won't say it. Provision is here. Provision is here. You don't have to be ashamed. Provision is here. Provision is here. Father, make a way out of no way. Father, because we've been with you, we're better for it. Because we've been with you, we're better for it. So, Father, I decree and declare in the name of Jesus that you would make ways straight in Jesus' name. Come on, shout amen. Where are you from? Be careful. Be careful.